Hey, doing? I'm Sean McVeigh with Sean's Outdoor Adventures, and in this video, I'm going to give you some tips for doing a do-it-yourself trophy hunt. One of the first things you're going to want to do is decide whether you want to do public land or private land. And if you're going to do private land, you're going to want to set a budget. Even if you're going to do public land, you should still set a budget. One, how far are you going to travel? Because obviously, travel expenses are going to increase the farther you go. But two, Pick a state, you know, in some states the hunting licenses cost a lot more than other states. So like I've hunted in Illinois a number of years and the hunting license in Illinois is over $500. Iowa, you're over $700. By the time you buy enough preference point to draw a tag in Iowa, you're up in the $700 range. Uh, you compare that to some other states, like let's look at Ohio and Indiana. I mean. Ohio is a hundred something for an out-of-state license. Indiana is probably in that ballpark too. Uh, Missouri is a couple hundred dollars for an out-of-state license. And another thing too is some of these states, like Iowa, it took me like almost five years to get a tag to hunt in Iowa. And here, hold on, let me pick this up. So here's the I went out and hunted in Iowa this year, and this is you know the buck I shot, and. I encountered some much better bucks, but at the end of the hunt, I was like, okay, I need to shoot one and go home. And this buck gave me the opportunity. This was only a two and a half year old deer. Um, obviously you're, you're kind of aiming for like a four and a half year old deer or better. But you know, um, like I said, I was hunting public land. It was the end of the hunt. I took this, um, harvested this deer, but I want to talk about, you know, this is a good two and a half year old deer. Let me pick up this. This is a, a public land buck, a mountain deer I shot in PA this year. It's a mountain deer, a two and a half year old mountain deer. Here's a two and a half year old <laughs> Iowa buck. You see how much, just incredibly much bigger the Iowa buck is. So when you're talking about doing a do-it-yourself trophy hunt, you want to go to a state that's going to provide trophy bucks. I mean, all deer in their own regard are trophy. But when you're thinking of a buck that's going to score high, Obviously, you want to pick the state that's going to provide that. So some states that I would suggest kind of looking into is, you know, start in Ohio. I mean, Western Pennsylvania is producing a lot of giant bucks as well. Uh, this buck came out of Western PA. And, you know, even today, my friend sent me a text message of a picture of a buck that was poached out there around the 200 inch mark. I mean, there are a lot of giant bucks coming out of Western PA. And what causes that is you got minerals in the ground, nutrition, and genetics. So those are some of the factors. And once you get into that soil gradient that, that starts in Western Pennsylvania, goes into Ohio, there are pockets of Indiana that are really good. Some areas, you know, I know people that live in Indiana are like, oh, you know, the hunting's not that great near me. I'm thinking, well, you know, Indiana does have some hot spots. So there are areas of Indiana that will produce some good bucks. Um, Illinois has produced a lot of great bucks throughout time and I've seen a lot of huge ones out there when I worked out there as a guide. Iowa, you know, I hunted out there this year. Uh, I didn't get video footage of the biggest buck I saw, but it was about 70 yards away. Probably would have scored in the 170s, maybe 180s, but just a giant, you know, like big mainframe 10, you know, long G2s, G3s, G4s, they're all real long, real widespread, and he had a nice big like four inch kicker coming off of the right main beam. Um, so, you know, those states are really putting out good deer. I mean, there are other states too that you could add to the list. But when you're thinking of a do-it-yourself hunt, those are some of the top states that kind of come out right away. Another thing to incorporate into your planning is your lodging. You know, there are a lot of states that allow camping on their public hunting land. Pennsylvania is not one of those states. So don't try to do that in Western PA. Uh, most campgrounds are closed during hunting season as well. So you wanna look into that if you're planning a camp. I personally, if, if you're doing a do-it-yourself trophy hunt, you wanna give yourself the best advantages possible. And I think staying in a hotel is a good idea and having a place where you can wash your clothes to keep them scent free, take your scent elimination showers, that kind of thing. That's the way I like to do it. And so that's what I would kind of suggest is kind of factor in your budget, if you can, to stay in a hotel. And so you're going to want to look into what's the cost of a hotel and how close are those hotels to where you want to hunt. Again, if you pick 
public land, obviously you know what you're dealing with, you know, public land. But if you're going to do a do-it-yourself private land hunt, and there's a lot of people, a lot of outfitters out there that provide that, you know, you want to look into do they provide lodging or do they make you get your own lodging? And is that, what's the, you know, what's included in the price? A lot of do-it-yourself outfitters, what they'll do is they'll give you the layout of the land, you pay, you are the only one, you and let's say your group of people that you're there with, uh, you're the only ones who have access to the land while you're there. So you're basically hunting private land. Let's say you, you have access to, let's say 500 acres. And there's, there's three or four of you. That's a good chunk of land, especially if a lot of it's wooded. And a lot of times they'll have a few tree stand locations that are set up for you that you can get started with, but then, you know, as you're there, you kind of figure out where you want to hunt and then you hone in on those spots. So if you're going to do um, a do-it-yourself outfitter type of a hunt, I would recommend going to as many sportsman shows as you can in the off season and meet a lot of these outfitters and talk to them because there are a lot of shady people in the industry and that's, it's a shame, but that's the reality of it. And, um, you know, I worked for a couple different outfitters and the one on his website, it said, you know, we have 23 tree stands for each hunter and each hunter has fresh tree stands that no one's hunted. You know, we, we take them down every week and we set stands up in new locations. And that was a huge lie. <laughs> I mean, a lot of his tree stands were up year round and they just never came down and they hunted those tr same tree stands all the time. In fact, one of the guys that I guided had been to this outfitter in the past and he came the last week of November, his first time out, and also brought his climbing tree stand along. And the only people who killed deer the week that he was there was him and one other guy and both did it in a climbing tree stand. Reason is, all those tree stands that were set up were just burnt out from being hunted and the deer, especially the good deer, were not going near them. And that can even happen on these do-it-yourself outfitters, you know, like they're bringing in hunters every week. And if these hunters every week are using those same stands, those same stands can get burnt out. So that's something to keep in mind when you're planning a do-it-yourself trophy hunt. One thing you can try to do is if you're going to do it on private land and, and pay to have access is, you know, you're meeting these people hopefully in advance and you're talking to them and say, hey, can we take a ride out during the summer and scout out the land that we want to hunt? You know, can we do that? And I'm sure there's a lot out there who will let you. And if you can do that, that is a good thing to do. Also check with them. Am I allowed to cut some shooting lanes? They might let you, they might have restrictions on that. But if you can get out there in the summer, get your spots picked out and trim a few shooting lanes, if they allow it, that is a good idea. All right, believe it or not, this is going to be one of the most important tips for you right here. Bring at least two sets of hunting boots. There's a lot of reasons for that, and I'm going to share some of them right now. One, if you're doing a do-it-yourself hunt, you're going to be putting on a lot of bootstrap miles. So that means your feet are going to be hot and sweaty. Uh, what you want to do is have a rotation of shoes. Let's say you do a morning hunt, and you did a lot of walking, and you're going to go back out to the car, or go back out to your lodge or your hotel, and maybe even shower up and go back in for an evening sit, then switch boots and put your ones that you're not using in an area where they can air out really well and they're not going to be caught in the rain or anything like that because you need these to get freshened up for the next day. You know, you're doing this, you know, wearing this pair for an evening sit, depending on how much walking you did will depend on how, you know, heated up they'll get and smelly they'll get. So you need a rotation of shoes. If you have one set of boots and you're doing a lot of walking every day, I mean, they're just going to get hot and smelly and you're going to have a hard time getting a deer when they can smell your feet a mile away. So at least two sets of boots have a good rotation system and a good airing out and deodorizing system in play. Now most people when they're doing a do-it-yourself hunt, they're doing it during the rut because that's when the big bucks are up and moving and they have a chance at them. With that said, a lot of times people will sit in the same spot the entire day which is a good strategy. However, if it's a do-it-yourself hunt and you've had limited or no chances of, of scouting in advance, you need to get your eyes on as much new areas of the property as possible. So what I would suggest doing is 
look at the maps of where you're going to be and try to create travel paths in and out of the stand that are going to give you opportunities to see new areas on the way, especially on the way out. Like getting in, you want to be quiet and you want to get set up and you don't want to be shining a light everywhere. But on the way out, um, if you have a nice bright flashlight, you can kind of slip over to an area that you're interested in looking at. Or even if you saw deer movement in the distance, you know, let's say you're set up here and 150 yards away, you were seeing deer. <laughs> and um, you wait till they move out of the area, even if you have to sit an hour after dark. <clears throat> and then you get down and you work your way over. If you have a nice bright flashlight, you can quick survey the area and see what was causing the deer to be here. And is there a tree that I can get set up in with my climber or a hang on stand? And then you, you quietly get your way out. So you wanna work that type of game plan into your day where you're scouting on your way out, even if it's in the dark, you know, bring that bright flashlight to make sure you can see what you're looking at. Now, if you're going for a five day or seven day hunt, you're going to want to pick as many tree stand locations for various wind directions in advance that you can. And being able to read maps, aerial photos and topographic maps is going to be a huge advantage to you if you can do that. And I encourage you to, to learn up on that in advance. Uh, you don't have to buy anything of, that I produce, but I do have a, a video that I sell on my website for how to read topo maps and aerial photos to find hunting hotspots. And there's a lot of people who are new at hunting who have written to me and said, wow, that, that video revolutionized the way that I see hunting and the way that I do hunt. So it, it does have a lot of good points in it. If it's something that's new to you, that's something that'll help you be effective in a um, do-it-yourself trophy hunt like this because you want to have as much advantage as possible going into something like this. That said, though, getting back to the point I was trying to make is, you know, have as many tree stand locations pinpointed for various wind directions, morning and evening sits, you know. Obviously the deer are going to be a lot of times having different travel corridors or moving in a different direction in the morning as opposed to the evening. So you need to have options for wind directions for that. But also, let's say you're on your hunt and you're like, man, I, uh, I burnt out that stand or I spooked that stand. I need another one with this wind direction. Being able to read maps, you can look at it and say, okay, I haven't scouted here, but based on the topography of the deer will probably utilize this area in that direction in the morning. I'm going to try that. And so it just gives you a little advantage, but try to have as many stand locations set up in advance that take into account every possible wind direction. Another thing to consider if you're going to use a tree stand is that you probably want to have options available. For instance, this year when I went to Iowa, I brought both a hang on stand with portable climbing sticks and my climbing tree stand. And I ended up having to rely heavily on the hang on stand because there were a lot of situations where I could not use the climber. So you want to have both at your disposal, depending on what your needs are going to be. Also, it's good to have a ground blind on hand. I brought one out. Uh, I didn't end up using it. And one of the reasons I didn't use it the one day, which it would have been a good thing to use, is the wind was blowing so hard, 25, 35 miles an hour, my stakes were not heavy duty and long enough to really hold that ground blind in place. So if you're going to bring a ground blind, make sure you bring real long heavy duty stakes and a little hammer or something you can hammer them in the ground, especially if the wind conditions are really blowing strongly. This is an important consideration for a do-it-yourself trophy hunt. At what point in time do you lower your standards of what you're willing to shoot? Like I, I did my Iowa hunt this year, let me pick up the rack again. So I went out to Iowa and especially the first day I went into it saying, okay, I want wow factor. I want to look at a deer and say, wow, I want to shoot that. If I don't do that immediately upon seeing the deer, I am not going to pick up my bow. I am not going to shoot. And you know, that day I was going from one potential stand location to another and kind of scouting along the way. I sat down to get a thorn out of my shoe and I look over and here's a buck making a scrape 19 yards away from me. And when I first saw him, he was, he was facing me straight on. This isn't the buck. He was facing me straight on. And I thought, well, he looks kind of young from this angle. And I was kind of like turning my head. My eyes were straining, looking to the side. 
and then he, you know, he walked around behind me and I got my other video camera, my good video camera out to uh, video him. And when I reviewed the footage that night, I thought, man, that was actually a lot better buck than I realized. And so one question to go into it, you know, when you see a buck on a do-it-yourself trophy hunt, ask yourself, if this is the biggest buck I see on this whole trip, will I be disappointed if I don't shoot this buck right now? come the end of the trip and if you say yes right away then maybe you should consider shooting another question to quickly ask yourself is if you have time if I don't shoot this deer right now and I see a bigger one later will I be relieved and glad that I let this buck go if you say no you know what I'd be happy with this deer well then hey get, get ready but if you think, no, you know, I, I just, this is so borderline, it's early in the hunt, I just, I'm just going to let it go. Then that helps you make that decision. So in my hunt, I, you know, had a close encounter with, with this deer I could have shot and chose not to. I had a close encounter with a buck I felt was a definite shooter, but I was moving the video camera arm so that I could get the shot. And he kind of saw me and that ruined that opportunity. If I wasn't videoing my own hunts then I probably would have got that shot off but then come the end of the hunt I'm hunting public land I needed to get home so I shot this seven point I mean this is a two and a half year old deer not something you necessarily go on a trophy hunt for but hey I was happy I worked hard I went in blind I, I didn't do any scouting in advance it was a blind map reading challenge and um I, you know, I harvested this deer. It was, it was, I put in a lot of work that week and I went home happy. I was happy, you know, with this deer. This deer made me happy after all that work and this is, this is what I got and I was happy with that. If you're not going to leave happy by shooting a deer like this, then don't do it. Even if you're on public land and you're allowed to, you know what I mean? Those are things though that you need to iron out and have clear guidelines for yourself while you're going through. Otherwise, you're, it's hard sometimes making a decision to pass or shoot. And asking some of those questions will help you make that decision in the moment, you know, while you're on your trophy hunt. So again, when I got to the end of my hunt, I was a little bit desperate and willing to shoot a 120 inch eight point if I had a chance at one, which is basically what I got. And I was, like I said, I was happy. But if you are hunting private land, like with an, a do-it-yourself outfitter, some of them, or even a lot of them, have minimum size requirements. Like this buck right here, this was in the low 140s. Some outfitters in trophy hunting areas have a, a minimum size requirement of 140 inches. Some only have a minimum size of 120 or 130. You need to ask those types of questions up front because if you go to one of these outfitters and you're not seeing many or any bucks like this on the hoof, then you might have a frustrating hunt and you might go home with nothing. Or if you shoot a buck, like this is a six point, this was a three and a half year old, it's only 100, it scored about 100 inch right here. You know, if you want to shoot something like this, when they have a size requirement like this, some of them have a fine of $1,000 some 500 you have to find out what's the minimum size requirement if any and do you have a fine if somebody shoots one under that and that's going to go into your decision making process as where you're going to do your trophy hunt here's another suggestion if you are somebody who can do a lot of research and that is look for estimate of deer per square mile some people look at how many deer are harvested and I mean that's one way of looking at it but if there's a lot of deer harvested that also means there's a lot of hunting pressure and so um, I prefer to look for deer per square mile so if you can do some research and find those statistics in the areas that you're looking at I would encourage you to go with the highest number of deer per square mile because it's going to give you the most action the most activity and when you're on a hunt there's nothing worse than seeing nothing at all you know and if you're doing all this work to do a do-it-yourself trophy hunt and you're not seeing any deer oof. That's going to be a tough week. Here's another important thing. Have a solid plan in place for how you're going to get a deer or animal out from your trophy hunt. How far in are you going? Do you have to do a pack out? If so, make sure you have the gear to do a pack out. If you've never done a pack out, you're going to need some heavy duty backpacks that can carry a lot of handle, a lot of weight. And you're going to want one with the, the kidney strap around here. 
just like you know backpackers do like on the Appalachian Trail or whatever um, you need something to take the weight off your shoulders when you have a lot of weight in the backpack if you're on private land with you know uh, you're paying somebody to use it or do they allow ATVs do they have one that you can use can you bring your own if you have one those types of things. Me, I personally have a hand deer cart, one of those little hand trucks that you can disassemble and put in your car. Uh, I use that to get my buck that I showed you to rack, this, this rack right here, the, my Iowa buck this year, I use the hand truck to wheel the thing out. Fortunately for me, I was hunting on public land that had access trails going all over the place, and so I was able to wheel it right out on the access trail. Are there access trails where you're gonna be hunting? If so, how will you use them to get to the parking area? If not, what will be your travel path to get the deer or the animal out if you're gonna use something like a hand truck or drive an ATV? So get that ironed out in advance because there's nothing worse than having a deer on the ground and being like, well, how am I gonna get this thing out of here? You know, you're standing there in the dark trying to put a plan together. It's a little late in the game for that. Have it all ready to go in advance. It's gonna make the whole trip and the recovery and the getting it out a lot easier. Here's another important thing for one of these types of hunts is research in advance where you're going to be able to get provisions. Especially if you're hunting public land, you're going to be doing a lot of driving probably, even with some of these outfitters. If, the, if you have to get your own lodging and drive to their property every day, you're going to be burning up gas. You're going to need to be able to find a place to fuel up. Some of these places are a little bit remote, so it's harder to find them. Uh, where can you get groceries? Where can you do laundry? You know, one of the advantages with an outfitter, if they provide lodging, sure, your price will be a little bit higher, but hopefully they'll have like a washing machine and dryer and you can do your laundry almost every day if you want to. With that in mind, I know a lot of people leave their clothes hanging out outside to air out. And I find that mine stay scent free better if I have a scent free area indoors because clothes take on odors when they're outside. I mean, you may have never heard that before, but I test everything. <laughs> you know, when I wash my clothes, I put them in the wash and I put them in the dryer with the special dryer sheets. And when I take them out, I don't smell anything. When I take those clothes and if I hang them outside and I go back an hour later, those clothes are starting to smell like they're taking on odors that are outside. When you take on natural odors and you combine that scent with clothing, it causes a derivative that is foreign to deer. They know it's human. They know it's not natural. And so that odor spooks them. So even if you wash your clothes, if you hang them outside and then you put your nose to it and you smell something, those deer are going to smell that something. And it's going to make it harder for you to harvest one if the wind isn't blowing in the right direction. Okay, the last tip I'll give you is... Be prepared to not have cell phone service. There's a lot of areas out there, especially in some of these states like Ohio, Illinois, Iowa, where the cell phone coverage is bleak and you might not be able to get calls or text messages in or out too easily, at least not right now. I mean, as time goes on, maybe those services will improve. But right now, um, they're not that great in a lot of areas and there are a lot of cell phone providers that just don't work in some of these areas. So if you're hunting private land, maybe you could ask the outfitter in advance, how's the cell phone service there? Do you have Wi-Fi access at the property? Uh, if you're staying in a hotel, do they provide Wi-Fi? Things like that. But when you're out hunting, you might not have cell phone service. So if you're planning to call somebody to help you get a deer out, you might not be able to. You need to have a plan in place in advance for that type of a thing. If it's an area you can drive to and explore and scout in the summertime beforehand, make sure you're looking. Do I have coverage? Does your friend have coverage? Does your friend have a different carrier than you do that you're planning to go out on this hunt with and you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna, I'll call him and he'll help me out. Will he have coverage? You, you got to find all that out in advance. And lastly, you know, obviously wherever you're going to get gas, make sure they have an ice machine, you know, where you can buy ice. Because if you do have a harvest, you're going to get that meat on ice as quick as possible so that it doesn't spoil. Another thing to be aware of is that due to chronic wasting disease, many states will only let you bring back a cleaned up skull plate as you know obviously the antlers will be attached to that so you got to make sure you know how to fully cape 
a deer hide off the face of a buck, and, you know, so you don't ruin it for doing a mount. You also are going to need a saw to cut the skull plate with. Another thing you could do is research a butcher and taxidermist in the area where you're going to do your hunt so that you can take it right to them, especially if you don't know how to butcher your own deer. So those are some tips for a do-it-yourself trophy hunt. I hope that's giving you stuff to think about if you're planning on doing one. They are a blast. They're a lot of fun. They're also quite expensive, but you can cut corners by hunting public land and camping if need be. Um, there's, there's different things that are available to you. But um, those are my suggestions. I prefer to stay in a hotel and get showered up and keep my clothes washed. Because um, if you're going to go that far and do that kind of a hunt, you might as well give yourself every advantage possible. So thanks so much for tuning in. Again, if you need help uh, learning how to read maps and aerial photos to find hotspots for hunting, uh, check out my website. There's a link in the description section of this video to get to it. Uh, you can purchase my video pretty inexpensively and download it to your computer and watch it and learn. You can watch it a hundred times and uh, you'll have it memorized. And that way you'll be awesome. You'll get deer all the time, hopefully. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, take care, God bless, and good luck on your do-it-yourself trophy hunt.